Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and I'm so excited today to be talking about the fantastic series Abbott Elementary with cast members Cheryl Lee Ralph, Lisa Ann Walter, and Janelle James. And, and Cheryl, kind of starting with a question for you, one of the things that I love about your character is she's that teacher that's that's very stern, kind of very strict, the rules are very precise, and yet the delivery is interesting. She never raises her voice. There's always a softness and a care that comes with it. Um, you know, and in looking at the idea of, of how she says things and what she's saying on the page, that could have gone in different directions. Um, and so how did you land on, you know, it's not going to be that there's kind of like an anger to the sternness. It's really coming from love and care and just like wanting to do a great job for these kids. And so that that would be the, the tone of your voice and the way that you found a lot of the lines. You know, for me, once I'm reading a script, very often the tone and the voice of the character will greet me. And then that's how I know, oh, I got this. It's like, I'm able to take myself and the character and put them together. And in a challenging situation, like an Abbott Elementary School, you would want to have a teacher who has been there, done that, does not want a new t-shirt or a cap, but still has the capacity to love and want the best for her students in some very difficult situations. So I was so happy when I read that script, she just presented herself. And it was that voice that just stays consistent, just like she is, just consistent. It's tough love, but it's the love that you need in order to make it out of this situation. And I love Barbara Howard. I, I just, and I respect Barbara Howard too, because I've known this woman over and over in my lifetime, and she always champions you right to the end. She does. And, and similarly, you know, Lisa with Melissa, she's so full of, of passion and fierceness and um, you know, what's great about her is that she loves very fiercely, but in her own very specific way, it's like, you know, actions, like I'm going to call this guy, I'm going to get this thing that you need, I'm going to solve this problem versus necessarily kind of wearing it all on the surface in terms of the things that she says to people. And so how did you find what what her love language was as a character and the way that she is so fiercely passionate about people around her? Well, I have to say, similarly to Cheryl, who, by the way, I love when she takes lines, uh, somebody else could do completely different, but she's so musical um, in her presentation that it's like music. You know, she'll come with her undertones or she'll come with her strong voice, but it's never, never yelly, um, except for Sweet Baby Jesus and the grown one, too. It was a completely different tone that came in. But um, I, the, the character popped off the page for me. And I know these people because they're in my family. And there's a hardness that comes from Northeast, from Philly, from New York. That's very that sounds like this. It's very it's hard. It sounds hard. But usually that toughness is covering um, softness. Um, and that's true personally. And it's, I think, even more true for Melissa. She, she'll tell you flat out in very clear words who she's going to kill for and, and means it. Um, but one of my favorite things about the character is that there are moments um, a lot of times on the talking heads where, where you see underneath where she reveals that she's got this like softy sentimental heart it just may be expressed in and if you don't you know agree with me I'll, I'll hurt you <laughs> so I, I that to me is a, a dichotomy that's a lot of fun to play and um and I know the people and they're all great wonderful warm people so it's hard not to play the warmth it's it, it's there it's written it's on the page you know but you just the the way it sounds is very <laughs> tough is my, my exes would all agree that I have a voice that could shrink men's balls. Are we allowed to say that? Probably we not. Are. <laughs> I'm going to take that back. I'm sorry, Cheryl. I don't think you can take it back. Okay. You know, and, and Janelle, and coming over to talking about Ava, she's she's such a charismatic character. But what's really interesting about her charisma is that it's both her biggest strength, but also we see that sometimes that is what hides certain vulnerabilities in her as well. You know, there was that moment towards the end of the season where we got to see her panicking, where she's like, I can't charisma myself out of this situation. I don't know if I can do that this time. Um, and so I was interested in how you kind of found what the charisma for her needed to be, because obviously that's how she operates in the world, you know, gets people to come along for the ride with her, um, but also kind of where you want 
wanted to have these moments where it's kind of compensating for, for not wanting to show some of those vulnerabilities to people on the surface? Um, well, I think uh, the main thing to remember for this character is that she invited the cameras into the school, mm -hmm. like they're there because of her and she wants to be on camera and she wants to be on, she wants to be famous basically. So that's her motivation. So I feel like the times where she's being very ch charismatic, that's just her being aware that she's on camera and she's uh, uh, presenting the, the character that she wants to present to the world. Basically, that's not really her. She's It's her turned up. And then when she's uh, flailing, that's more her because she has to be herself and, and speak in her real voice. So I just, uh, I'm just try to always be aware that I remember that, yeah, this, this person is a person who is playing to the cameras, maybe more than any other character. And so she knows when to turn it on. And then when that doesn't work in real life, that's when she gets flummoxed because no one is all one thing, you know? So, yeah. Talking about no one is all one thing. There's a moment in the, in one of the episodes where, Ava comes out of the school and the camera follows her and she's had a bad day and it is her grandmother and the way you see her change and she touches her hair and she says is everything all right grandma I will I'll be home later and the way that the grandmother character just looks at her and she looks Ava looks at her I was just like oh my god it just, I was like, wow. I love being able to see that, you know. You. Yeah, she has a life outside of this documentary that she's set up for herself. <laughs> and, the camera, and the camera followed her. I'm the sorry. Camera follow, the, the camera, camera followed, followed her. you. Take the character outside. with that part. She wouldn't have wanted that part to be shown because she right. has a whole identity that she's made up for herself. Right. So, and that's the, 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 fun, the, the, fun, the fun part. Right. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> And, and with that idea of the cameras being in the school and following them, you know, what you're saying about the, the different responses and the different ways that they see the characters. Um, I was interested in how you kind of found that dynamic of how, you, how much you want your characters to be aware when you want them to be aware, because there's times, you know, where Ava's specifically turning, she's having a conversation with someone and in the middle of it, half the conversations to the camera. So you're mm -hmm. really kind of playing to it. Like you said, you mm -hmm. know, like Lisa, you were talking about like the moments of kind of quiet vulnerability. And, you know, there's some great moments, Cheryl, where for Barbara, she's the person who kind of addresses it the least. She's like, I have a job to do and I've got to focus, but there's still times where she'll give kind of like a little side-eye judgment of something that someone's saying. It's like, I need to have this moment and I guess I can have it over here. And so how did you find the intricacies of how aware you want them to be of the cameras in the school and when you want that to kind of come into the fold and when you really want it to be about capturing those vulnerable, quiet moments in between? For me, it was the fact that I do not believe that Barbara feels or believes the camera should be there at all. And it's just the fact that people need privacy. Our students need privacy. Not everybody needs to know everything that's going on in this school. And here we have Ava, who is just another one in a long line of people who are going to do absolutely nothing, bringing these cameras into our school because they are covering what underfunded public schools. Mm, mm, mm. And that's the aria. No you just heard the aria. <laughs> I pay no attention to those cameras because they do not deserve my attention. No. Mm -mm. I do want to say that a lot of the, the look to cameras are not scripted. That's right. Um, so when I do it, I, I mean, I feel like that's a thing that people do in real life now. I don't know if it if that happened after we saw mockumentaries or before, but I I know I always I do it in real life where you're just like, did that just happen? You know what I mean? And so I'm doing it uh, organically in in the moment, and then we don't know until we see the show what what they've kept or not. But a lot of the times, I'm looking at the cameramen who are like my friends now. Like, did you hear that? So uh, that's what's. Um, that's how I choose. I, I'm just doing it organically. It's nowhere in the script that says look the camera, you know. It's nowhere in the script that says add a hair flip, but she does a brilliant hair flip with a lot of the, yes, I did that. I mean, there's brilliant hair. I can't do it like she does. It. She does brilliant hair flips. I think, I think Melissa is, uh, well, obviously from the beginning, from the pilot episode, you're like, who are you? Why are you here? 
I don't know you. You're not from this city. You're not from this town. You're not my people. So I can't trust you. Just very Sicilian. Um, but I, as it goes along, she starts to, you know, trust or like some of them. So I have different relationships with different cameramen. There's one that I, that I am more, um, that Melissa, I should say, is more willing to be open to because she thinks he's cute. But um, I think, I, I think also that particularly for me, I made a, a choice as an actor to not reveal too much until a little further in where Melissa got comfortable with them, at least purposely. The camera catches her doing stuff, which is one of the brilliant aspects of this genre is that you get caught, which is a, and sometimes you know you got caught and then you adjust, like they just caught me doing that. And sometimes you don't know you got caught. So both of those are valuable things for in editing for the story. But for my favorite one, it was about three quarters of the way through the season, um, the art teacher one, where Melissa is really hard throughout the entire episode. In fact, I was concerned. I'm like, are they going to let her be this violent? Um, and yes, apparently. Um, where she goes to attack this art teacher who's messing with this project that she's done her whole career. And then her talking head is showing this bunny plate of the first kid who um of the of the the first time somebody did this project and her and all of the hardness melts away and she's really soft in that moment and the camera is the thing that catches it not she doesn't show it to barbara she's nobody else sees it it's just the camera so it it makes for some fun play for i think for the show and also as an actor it does, you know, and, and also in terms of finding moments in scenes, you know, I, I think like you and the rest of, of the cast always talk about it's on the page, the writing's there. It's not about the ad-libbing, but there are kind of like those small moments where it's like, well, how are, how am I going to play this moment? There's different options I can try. Um, you know, Janelle, I've heard you mention that, that it was kind of like a few episodes in where you started to really find that comfort with the character to want to kind of like try out, you know, maybe I'll change this word here or this like little line or try something different, mm. um, you know, and like, Cheryl, I love the fact that like the Hank has two turkeys thing singing, like it wasn't singing on the page, but that was something that you found. And so how do you go into scenes kind of being very specific to the script because the writing is so meticulous and so brilliant, but still creating that freedom for yourselves where when there is something that you want to try or you want to try a different delivery, you're really kind of taking the time to hopefully try and find it. I think one of the things I always lean on is when Quintus said, that she cast the absolute perfect people for these roles. So I just lean into the fact that if I'm the perfect person for this role and I am truly living this character, living this role, what would this teacher do to help this other teacher who is flailing? Well, I can't just talk to him. I gotta get him excited, you know, give him a little dance, sing to him. And I don't know where, Hank has two turkeys, he gets two more. Don't ask me where that little fake samba came from, but it was when we got ready to do it, it was just there. And then Lisa just fell into it like she knew the song. And I was like, see, that's just, that's, that's just fun chemistry. That's just characters chemistry. Cause you can't make that up. And that happens a lot with, especially with the two of us. Like they don't, they'll say it's a talking head and you don't remember the teacher's name that they're discussing that's leaving, the art teacher. And we, we just play off each other. We're not even looking at each other. We're just doing stuff together that's not in the script, but it's just us behaving and being comfortable and having chemistry. So it's that, that part is really fun. Or responses to like stuff Ava says, like we'll be there together and we both have different responses, but it's... It's organic. Poor Ava. Yeah. Poor Ava. One day, one episode, we're just yeah. gonna have to see everybody's responses to Ava. <laughs> oh my God. He'd I love mean, that. Anyway. There was, that was, <laughs> <laughs> there was well, I, when I, she I, gave me that that damp bra money. Oh my God. I was like, mm. oh no, she didn't. Well, I do like that scene because that uh when Barbara says my name and Ava when she's saying you better have my money the next you know in the script it says huh but I played it I remember making a conscious decision to play it like as if I'm very deathly afraid of Cheryl because I think of Miss Howard because I want to convey that she is 
the she's really the head of the school. Everybody respects her, including Ava, who don't respect anybody. You know what I mean? And so she's even Ava is afraid of of, of what Miss Howard thinks. You know, so that's why you know I did it like huh, like a like a child basically because her Miss Howard voice can render anybody back to childhood is what I was thinking. And, um, as far as like ad libbing, yeah, it's a, you know this is my first well. I, my first big role, scripted role. So it did take me a while to just everything, learn how to be on set, where to stand, all that, all those things were happening. But I don't, one thing Quinta does that's that I appreciate is she says, you know, this is a script, but say it how you would say it. Mm -hmm. So we're still saying a lot, but say it how you would say it. So I was doing that. And then we have directors who are very nice at the end of saying it, how it's written, say, might, might say, do you have anything? And then that's when I get to rattle off stuff like uh, back my tasty ass up. But I never, I never thought that would make it in. And then I see it on TV. <laughs> I'm like, surely ABC is going to put that. And then, and then it's in there. So it's not, um, you know, like an ad lib fest, but they do give us chances to do it. And then it sometimes you, you see what you came up with in the, in the final product. So that's always mm -hmm. cool. Yeah. And not, not just in the final product, but a meme back my tasty ass up is. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, like when I said that, you know, uh, Quinta was on the floor, passed out, and I came out and I said, I'm going to back my tasty ass. I think it just said, I'm going to get out of here. That was the original line. Yeah. And yeah. I came out after doing, I'm going to get it out of here. I said, I'm going to back my tasty ass up. And Quinta sat up and she said, what did you say? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Tasty ass up. And she was like, that's funny. And she laid back down. <laughs> and yeah. so we got to do it. And then it ended up in the show. So that was, that was great. Yeah, that, that happened with what French Hell is. I remember there were a couple of ones like that. And she one was what the desking episode when they had all the desks in the in the gym. And I said, What fresh hell is this? Which I thought never, they're never gonna let Shakespeare. Yeah. And she was like, I like that, keep that in. <laughs> and and so like things like that happen all the time. It's mm -hmm. I mean, not all the time, I shouldn't say all the time, but here and there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, Lisa and Cheryl, obviously your two characters are the two that have been at the school the longest. And, you know, they've, they've seen all the principals come and go, different teachers come in like Janine and try to ch shake up and change the system and sometimes end up disillusioned, sometimes manage it. Um, and so there's such great shorthand, but I feel like from the very first episode, you captured that essence of a real history between the two of them. Like you said, you even just like the little looks that they give one another, the way that they're always sitting in exactly the same place in the, in the staff room. Um, and so how did you find those elements of, of not just like, what are the little looks and the little chemistry things that speak to their history, but even just things like when you're going into blocking scenes, making sure like, this is where they would sit. This is where they would be in the room in relation to everybody around because of their relationship with one another, because they That's always it. kind of really pull each other to the middle. Yeah, we told, we told the directors, we were like, yeah. they would sometimes try to put us at different tables. And we were like, you know, now other people even say, Barbara and Melissa sit here always. Yeah, exactly. So I, it's sort of like now after 13 episodes, um, a lot of our, even our extras and uh, guest people that come on who have watched, you know, some of the show, the, the show, you know, they're like, oh no, those folks are over there. Or no, you can't go over there because that's their space. And it's like, yeah, you're absolutely right. This is our space. Don't come over here in a yeah. very nice way. One episode, they uh, Chris or somebody, they wrote it this way. Somebody sat down in what's Melissa's seat and she just walks back to go sit down and just stares at him until he gets up and moves. Up. And, and, and the other stuff that's, that's our play, that's our exchange is honestly just, that came from the very first day of shooting the pilot. We sat down and started talking and we shared so much similar history and um, just, we just shared a lot. And so we became friends very quickly the way you sometimes do. Luckily, if you're on, in a show, you make friends with somebody be, and because they become your family for that movie for that three or four months or whatever. But in the case of Cheryl, I just loved her right away. So I, I don't think it was made up. I think we just, we just fell into a really good rapport. Yeah. So I love that, you know, and, and Janelle talking a little bit more about Ava as well. It's again, there's, there's different ways that you could have played the narcissism of the character, but you've played it in a way that 
even if we don't necessarily kind of see why she's making certain choices or doing certain things that we understand where it comes from. You know, it's like, it feels like even though she doesn't do a lot of things that are with other people's interests first, like she thinks that she is, she's at least trying in her head, you know, and especially kind of getting more of those moments later in the season where we got to know a little bit more about her world outside. You really kind of bought her to this space by the time that the other teachers overhear her you know, with the superintendent pleading for money, giving her case and, and really talking about how much she admires everybody that works there. That felt like a very natural and real thing for her character. It was like, she has come to this space. Mm -hmm. And so how did you kind of work throughout the season to kind of have those little moments where it like builds under the surface more and more so that by the time we hear her saying those things, we know that that genuinely is how she feels. And we know that it's not just her saying it for a money grab for the school. Hmm. Well, um, first, I always think, do narcissists ever think they're bad people? No, that's part of their thing. That's part of the problem with them. They never know that they're narcissists. And then also I imagine Ava to be a product of the same school system that she's now a principal of. Mm -hmm. So I feel like if you've come, if this character has come through this, this system and nothing has changed and she's made it to principal, why this person as a narcissist would try to take that to her advantage. She knows, she knows that nothing has changed. She knows she doesn't have any power. It's kind of above her. So she's like, how can I take advantage of this situation that I found myself back in, basically, is how I, I think about her. And then again, with the whole no one is all one thing, nobody is all bad. We all have uh, responsibilities and in, in a life not out, only outside the school, but away from the cameras. You know what I mean? So this character that she's doing, for the cameras is not who she is. And so, you know, you can't be even a narcissist around all them cutie pies and not care about them. All I, all the kids are, kind of are adorable. Mm -hmm. and so she uh -huh. does see what's going on and, and has lived it, like I said. So that's what I think is like coming through as it, as it goes on. You see that she has been paying attention, but there's, I don't, as Barbara said in the first episode, there isn't much she can do. <laughs> I don't, I, that's how I, believe of the character it's not only that she's not doing it it really isn't much she can do there is no money there is no funding there is no which is the whole basis of the show so but when so she, she might as well make a giant banner uh, with her face on it i mean sure might, might as well, might as well. That way. How, how far does three thousand dollars really go for an entire school <laughs> well, the funny part about that whole thing for me was when i looked at the banner i said that woman bought a new wig. wig. To take the picture Everybody, that kind of slipped under the radar. The banner. <laughs> that kind of slipped on the radar. But I really think a narcissist would think, hey, well, this school is, is, is trashy and we don't get money. If I become famous, maybe then this school would be the special school in this district that will then get things. I think that my character would think something like that. Of course, that's not true. Ah. That's her motivation. But she also, I mean, Ava goes and helps with the step class and a little bit that's like, look at me, I know how to do this. But, and and then when she does it, the actuality of it is, I'm just going to hang out and have friend, girlfriend time. But but she also teaches them. She also does a great step class. So she does little things. She wants to do things that she's interested in. Basically. Yeah. I mean, that's how I live life too. If it ain't fun, I'm not trying to do it. So I, I totally got that part of her motivation. But um, yeah, she's like, oh, I, I could do this, but that's not fun. And, that's an interesting and also outside my job, whereas the other teachers are doing all the jobs. You know what I mean? She's like, I'm here to be on camera and do things that interested me at different points, but that's not going to be all the time. Yep. <laughs> there was an interesting moment in that episode where Ava, the Ava, I think Lisa, um, Lisa and I are standing together and Just she says, she says something to the effect of, I don't like school. Yeah. I was like, what? I hate, I mean, well, she goes, she goes like this. She goes, I hate school. And we, and that, that was a time when Cheryl and I both had a reaction to camera. Yeah. And then she said something like that six years it took me to graduate. Something exactly. Like and I, and I go, I can go, wait a minute, six. And she just bumps me with her elbow. I'm like, all right. I mean, I've been told te by teachers that they're real principals who who would say the same. So I guess that's why they become principals and not the teachers. They like admin, but not not school. Oh, well, see, <laughs> they like you know being in not school. So I, yeah, that rang true to me. <laughs> because I took, it, I took it as if she's an under if she was an undergrad, 
that she took six years to get out of her undergrad before moving on to her master's and her PhD. And I, I thought to myself, oh my God, who is this woman? At that moment in the show and the development of her character, oh, I was concerned. Oh, I took, I, was, that, as, Howard was I took that as she took six years in undergrad, not because she wasn't smart, but because she was having a lot of fun. That's what I thought, too. That's the she's same smart. thing I thought. She's very, Ava's very smart, but I don't yeah, think she's not a stupid person, but no, you know, I don't, she I don't was an undergrad it. for a reason. If, if, it's if, Ava had, <laughs> if Ava had a PhD, don't you think she'd make everybody call her Dr. Ava? <laughs> like, that, that's true. She oh, would. Absolutely. Yeah. She should get a she should get an honorary doctorate from one of the schools nearby just to make sure people have to call her doctor. What for creating a mockumentary about yes. our whatever? Yes. yes. <laughs> Barbara's not impressed. No, I'm not impressed. <laughs> you know, and talking a little bit more about Barbara as well. I love, you know, she is someone who's seen everything in the school system. And so there's times where she's willing to put her energy into things. And there's times where she's just like, it's just not worth it. I know that there's going to be no outcome. So I'm going to channel my energy where I know things are going to work. But at the same time, there's also so much that she does that she doesn't even tell people about it's because for her, it's not about other people acknowledging the job she's doing. It's like, if she knows that she's done a job, well, that's the reward in itself, you know? And even when she talks about applying for the same grant for 10 years, there's been no success from that, but she still does it. And so how do you kind of look at her and the undercurrent of like everything that she's probably doing behind the scenes, beneath the surface, behind closed doors that nobody even knows just because she wants to do a good job for herself and for the students. I love that. I love that about the character. I love the fact that she's not showboating. I love the fact that she's not out there to get the extra attention. I love the fact that she is just doing the job that matters most for her students. You know, like so many of the folks in our cast, I'm surrounded by educators. I got a message this morning from my brother, who's a teacher up in Albany. And he was like, my eighth grade class is crazy about Abbott Elementary. Would you please send them a graduation message? And I was just like, wow. You know, caring, going the extra mile for their students. My auntie Carolyn, you know, was a, a teacher turned principal in Washington, DC, and the many things that she did for her students because she felt that they deserved more, that they just needed access to more, including, you know, and I've told this story often, you know, inviting the Queen of England to her school and the Queen actually came and sipped tea in Bunker Hill, you know, elementary school there in DC. I wonder if she got a message from the queen this month though. But, you know, I just, I just think about that. And my dad always with the extra classes for the students, always with the helping them to succeed. They're all a little bit of Barbara Howard. They keep their head down. They do the work because that's the calling they received as teachers. And, and I love it that there's so many more of them out there now really doing the, the hard work and the heavy lifting every day. And we get to lift them up, elevate them on the platform that's Abbott Elementary. And I love it. Absolutely. Well, I love everything that you've bought and all the richness that you've bought to these characters. You know, like you were all kind of saying, nobody is one person and you've really captured that in the way that you've brought them all to life. Um, can't wait for the second season of the show already. And thank you so much to all three of you for talking about it today. Oh. All right. Thank, you. Thank you. Thanks very much.